2, 18 through 25. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all, all of this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. You may be seated. Today we're looking at John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. You know, I, I don't know that you come on Sunday morning, what kind of sermon you're looking for. Some people need a pep talk. Some people need a rah-rah session. Some people need a quiet and contemplative type of service where they just focus and look inside and Others uh, are wanting something to stir them emotionally, but there are others, like myself, who's always looking for a truth that will help me understand God better, understand what He expects of me better, something that will help me in this journey. Only God knows how long we're going to be here. He has allowed me to be here for 62 years. Just hard to believe that. This morning I was lying in bed in the early morning hours thinking back upon various churches that I pastored, various experiences I've had with God's people over the years. And I was thinking about in New Orleans when I went there to pastor 33 years ago. And to me, it seems like it was just the year before last. Think about all these people that I met, these lives that I touched, these lives that touched me. And I lay there thinking, will I, will I see any of those people before heaven? When I get to heaven, will I see any of those people? The journey of life, wow. We've been looking at John's gospel for several weeks now, and John is giving us a record of the life and the ministry of one named Jesus, the Christ. That's what John's doing in this gospel. And as you'll see, he is set on proving to everyone that this Jesus is God himself. He says that God decided, the God of this universe decided to come into our world in human flesh, looking just like we look. You and I understand that. It's called the doctrine of of Christ. Well, let me inform you that there are some religious groups who call themselves Christians who deny that Jesus is God. And that's why we're repelled by them as Christians, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, Jesus wasn't God. The Mormons, Jesus wasn't God. And that's the main reason we, we look at them and say, what? Let me show you some things about Jesus, and then you tell me if it sounds like he must be God. John, for example, begins his book this way. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And he says the Word was God. And as you know, he goes on to tell us this Word has a name. And his name is Jesus. So Jesus is God, according to John. 
The disciple called Jesus my God. And Jesus told him he was blessed for knowing that. In Hebrews 1, the writer says that Jesus created the universe. Well, Genesis tells us that God did that. Therefore, Jesus must be God. In several other places in the New Testament, Jesus is called our God and our Savior. Over in the book of the Revelation, Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Well, in the Old Testament, God is identified as the first and the last. Therefore, Jesus must truly be God. In the book of the Revelation, uh, or rather, uh, I'm repeating myself, I've lost my thought. We, we see in the New Testament other things. For example, Jesus forgives sin. Only God can forgive sin. In the New Testament, Jesus receives worship. In fact, he commands that he be worshipped. But only God is to be worshipped according to the second commandment in the Decalogue. In Colossians 2.9, the apostle Paul says that in Jesus all the fullness of deity dwells. So it's unmistakable that the Bible presents Jesus as God in human flesh. And John wants to make this known. This is what he's doing. That's his purpose in writing this gospel. He wants to make it known that this Jesus is God himself. That's what he's doing here. Now as we come to today's passage, let me remind you that Jesus has just cleansed the temple. Remember that last week? It was being contaminated. They were contaminating the temple. As we come to today's passage, you need to remember that he has just driven lots of people out of the temple. Those who were selling animals and exchanging money. He also drove the animals out. I told you that scholars believe that this indeed was a miracle in itself. And most people don't see it. They say, how could one person have driven out thousands of people? How could one man have gotten away with shutting down all these businesses there in the temple courts? How was it that no one stopped him? How was it that no one even attempted to stop him? There would have been thousands and thousands of people there. There were normally in the temple 300 temple guards that guarded the place that since this was Passover there would have been substantially more than the 300 who were there. So why didn't they step up and arrest Jesus? Scholars say something miraculous was going on. That there was a divine power obviously that was holding them back. So what we've observed so far here in chapter 2 is the Lord's miracle working power. And don't forget that we already saw where he changed water into wine. We've already seen in his baptism a voice that came from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. We also saw when the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And as we come to today's passage, John wants to show us something else. Again, he is attempting to prove that this Jesus is God. And so what he does, he gives us a glimpse of his omniscience. We've already seen his miracle working power. Now we're going to see that Jesus must be omniscient. Well, only God is omniscient. Only God 
knows everything. Of course, the word omniscience, you know, omni means all, everything. Science means knowledge. So omniscience is all knowledge. Only God has all knowledge. God knows everything there is to know. And Jesus is going to demonstrate that he knows all. And of course, this will be one more testimony to his deity. So, let's go ahead and take a look at these uh, verses. We're going to finish the second chapter of John's Gospel. Let's look at it. The Jews then responded to him, responded to Jesus. What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? He had just shut down the business enterprise that was going on in the temple. The Jews, probably the Pharisees and the Sadducees, asked him, what sign can you show us that you have the authority to do such a thing? You see, they were outraged, obviously. Who do you think you are? What gives you the authority to do what you just did? They were upset. That's what they were asking. Now, they know that he's claiming to be God because he's just said, uh, you've turned my father's house into a business. The news would have already circulated that John the Baptist was calling him the Lamb of God. Surely they had heard about the miracle that he had just done at Cana. Surely they had heard about his baptism. So in light of all this, they wanted some kind of sign from heaven. Look at this. He'd already given them some signs. And as you will see down in verse 23, John says that during the Passover, he was doing other signs. But apparently these signs were not good enough. They weren't convincing enough. Some scholars believe they were asking for what they called heavenly signs, not earthly signs. In fact, on several occasions, this is exactly what they asked for. If you remember, they say, Give us a sign from heaven. What would that be? What would that be? Well, some theologians think it means they were wanting some kind of sign from the sky. They wanted something to happen overhead. Something separate from all of us. They wanted fireworks or, or divine writing or something literally coming from above. That's what they suspect these, these people were asking. I mean, Jesus didn't look divine to any of them. He looked like just any old man, any other man. He looked like a natural man in every sense. So the earthly miracles weren't sufficient for them, I guess. So Jesus says, I'll give you a sign. Look at this. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it again in three days. Now, verse 21 tells us that he was referring to his body. Destroy this body of mine, that's what he was saying, and I'll raise it back to life in three days. Now, he wasn't commanding them to do that at this particular time. To kill him right then. He was speaking about a future event, obviously. You see, he was omniscient, right? He knew what was coming. I mean, the reason he was born, the reason he came to earth was to die. And when you think about it, the same is true for us. Everyone was born to die. We're all on the course to do that. In fact, Scripture says there is appointed a day already. There's a day in which 
we're going to die. Every one of us, each of us. When is that day? Not a one of us in here. Not. But there's a day appointed. We're all on course to do that. Life on earth culminates for everyone at their death. The journey will be over. Our work will be done. Our preparation for eternity, if you will, will be completed. Jesus said, you destroy me and I'll raise myself, this temple of mine, in three days. Of course, we know what he meant. He come back from the dead on the third day. Jesus saw it all in the future. He knew they were going to kill him. I don't think his killers knew that. Yet, there's no indication at this point that anyone was actually planning to kill him. But Jesus knew that it would be his resurrection. It would be, that would be the sign from heaven, if you will, that ultimately solidified his claim to be God himself. If you remember, there were angels from heaven in his tomb giving testimony that he had risen. Jesus left this world in death, but he came back from heaven. So Jesus says, you want a sign from heaven? I'll give you one. But the sign will be in the future. And obviously, what he was saying didn't satisfy them. And I could understand that, and I would have been so satisfied with that answer. Yeah, after all, they said, what authority do you have to do this? And he starts talking about something they don't really understand, and, and even if they had, it would have been something way out there in the future. I want to show you something I discovered this week as I was reading. As I was kind of wrestling with, what did you why could he have done this? Why? He, he could have given them something else. I mean, I think humanly, I mean, had I been Jesus, I would have done something, I guess. I, for example, I would have said, uh, Mark, you want, you want some proof? And I would have just lifted them up to the ceiling, you know, sort of like dangling them about 15, 20 feet up in the air. But what do you think about that? Huh? I'm going to let you go? No, I, I'm convinced. I mean, that's what you or I, wouldn't we do something like that? Yeah, we would. And J Jesus could have done that. He could have done all kinds of things. Over in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And the Jews were offended by that. What? You are the Lord of the Sabbath? No, God is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus he was the Lord of the Sabbath. And if, and if you read about it, you'll see that they ask him the same thing. Where do you get your authority? To say something like that. And then again, they ask him for a sign. Jesus responded by saying, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. That's what, that was his response. What did that mean? I mean, what does it mean? A wicked and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Well, I, I did some reading, and let me tell you what many theologians suspect it means. They take it to the story a story that Luke tells. The Gospel writer Luke tells the story about a rich man in Lazarus who in Hades. The rich man was suffering in torment. And he could see Lazarus afar off. Hades was separated. Paradise and Hades, a pleasant portion of Hades, a, an unpleasant portion. And the rich man was in the place of torment. Lazarus wasn't. And uh, he, he asked, Lazarus did, if, if uh, or rather the rich man, if Lazarus could be sent back from the dead to warn the rich man's brothers about 
such a place as this. He wanted to warn not to come to the place where he just found himself to be. And the Lord's interesting response was this. He said, if your brothers don't believe Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe if someone comes back from the dead. And theologians say that the point is this. If they do not believe the Holy Scriptures, there really isn't anything that they'll believe. They won't believe simply because someone returns from the dead. They won't believe that. What they'll do is just ask for another sign. Give me another sign. That was not good enough. Give me another sign. Show us one more. And by the way, I have studied the various religious movements of our day and movements for generations past. And one of the reasons that the Gospels and Charismatics and others like to major on signs and wonders and claim miracles and fake healings and, and that kind of thing is because that's what people are looking for. And that's what people will believe. The Bible isn't good enough. Let me remind you all that Romans 10, 17 says that faith, salvation, comes by hearing the Word of God. And that's why the Word of God is so important. And that's why when someone assaults the Word, when they say, this is just in a book written by men, when they assault the Word, I don't think they really know what they're doing. I'm not sure we always know what that means. Faith comes by Hearing the word. That means it doesn't come by signs and wonders. Well, when Jesus told them to destroy this temple, then he would raise, rise again in three days and he would raise it again. That, that temple, his temple, uh, they didn't know what he was talking about. Look at what they said. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? They thought he was talking about the literal temple, okay? That, that would have been Herod's temple at the time. Let me give you a little history about the temple, incidentally. Over the course of, of history, there were three, three temples built on that spot. The crowning achievement, I'm sure you it is. Crowning achievement of Solomon's reign was the erection of the very first temple in Jerusalem, often called Solomon's Temple, or the first temple. Solomon's father, King David, had wanted to build a great temple for God a generation earlier, but as you probably know, God wouldn't let him do it. God said no. Solomon began building the temple in 966 B.C. Well, the Babylonians destroyed that temple 400 years later, in the year 586 B.C. And it was 70 years after the destruction of Solomon's temple, in 516 B.C., that a guy by the name of Zerubbabel led the building of of a second temple. You see, he was a leader, Zerubbabel was, among the captive Jews who were returned to Jerusalem, allowed to return to Jerusalem. In fact, allowed specifically for the purpose of rebuilding the temple. Well, over time, that temple, which, by the way, was nothing, nothing like Solomon's temple, it began to fall apart. It was in disarray. And somewhere around 15 or 20 B.C. in that area, King Herod decided that he would rebuild the temple. It, it was actually still there, parts of it. He, he was just going to remodel, actually, or reconstruct it. It was, as I said, in disarray. So when we come to today's passage, the reconstruction of the temple 
had been going on for exactly 46 years. Still wasn't finished. They've been working on it for 46 years. It's this temple that would become known as Herod's temple. So they're looking at Jesus like he's crazy when he says that if they destroy this temple, he'll rebuild it in three days. They were thinking, are you crazy? Are you joking? It's taken 46 years to build this thing. And you're going to raise it up in three days? What they were saying. Herod hadn't even accomplished it. King here in 46 years. So how are you going to do that? And that's why John the writer adds this right here. He says, but the temple he spoke of was his body. Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple. But why didn't Jesus explain that to them? And I, as I'm reading this again, you know, it would be interesting to the authority. That's why I said tonight, I've done something crazy about what you offer. But I mean, why didn't they, ex why didn't they explain this? And it occurred to me that actually he tells us why he talked like that. And another passage, it's the same reason he spoke in parables. He said that he spoke in parables to hide the truth from those that think they were wise. And he reveals the truth to babes. In other words, he wants those who desire to truly understand he wants them to understand. And he wants to hide his truths from those who are obstinate and who refuse to believe. And no amount of signs and wonders will ever convince them. He's not going to satisfy them. Look at verse 22. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled And they believed the scripture in the words that Jesus had spoken. Believe the scripture. What scripture? All the scriptures from the Old Testament that talked about the coming Messiah and what he would do, who he would be, including his death and his resurrection, as well as all the words that Jesus had spoken. They finally got it. They finally got it. It's the same for us, folks. Often, I think, as I was, in fact, preparing this very message, I remember the first time I preached from the Gospel of John, through the Gospel of John, 40 years ago. And I was thinking, as I was preparing this, I wish I had known 40 years ago what I know now. I wish I had known this. I, I didn't see it that clearly. The longer we walk with the Lord, the more we get it, the more we know, the wiser we are. Listen, I have such great admiration and respect for elderly people who have walked with the Lord for so many, many years. Like the leeches and Christians most of their lives have studied the Word of God and gone through trials and tribulations and seen ups and downs. I'm sure they know far, far more than I know because of the length of time they have walked with Jesus. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. So here was Jesus doing signs. We're not 
specifically what other signs he was doing that he was giving them. Signs, apparently, though, wasn't the kind the Jewish leadership was asking for. Exactly what kind that was they wanted, we don't know. We can only surmise. I told you that some scholars think they were wanting some kind of celestial signs, some, some cosmic, heavenly signs. But notice that it does say that many didn't believe in his name. Apparently, there were a lot of folks that those signs were, were good enough for, and they believed. Now, modern-day evangelists and pastors are so into writing down the number of all the people who come to believe. This many people were saved under my ministry, so they would have counted all those folks as conversions. But hold up. Did you notice the next verse, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. And I have to get you to see something <coughs> interesting. I pulled out my, my uh, interlinear, which gives the English and the Greek word. And I wanted to look at every word in the, verse 24, because I thought, what, what is the Greek word for entrust? I want, you to, I want you to know that in verse 23 where it says, many believe the, the Greek word I'm just telling you is not to impress you. It's the word pistuo. Pistuo means believe. And that's the word that Jesus, that John uses there. Many believed in his name. Meaning they believed in him as Messiah. That's what he was claiming to be. And so when we come to verse 23, or, I want to see what Greek word was used for entrust. And I discovered something interesting. It is the exact same word, pistuo, that's used in verse 23. So in other words, and this is how the, the interlinear gives it, it literally says that many believed in Jesus, but Jesus was not believing in them. Interesting, huh? That means he didn't believe in their believing. He didn't believe their faith. Which means they didn't have true faith. That means they must have loved, though, those miracles. Whatever those signs were that he was doing. They must have enjoyed whatever thrill. They must have gotten an emotional thrill. Maybe some tears. And what he was doing. Maybe he gave a few of them some gifts. I don't know who, whatever. Who knows? He did some miracles. We aren't told. He never created food. We see him do that on other occasions. But the truth is, they didn't really believe. And then, you know, Jesus goes on to say on another occasion, he says, you know what? Everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, they aren't for real. They aren't for real. Many of these folks who claim to believe in Jesus didn't have a saving faith. And so that's why I say, oh, they have this emotional experience. Listen, I'm old enough. I'm old enough. <laughs> not as old as y'all are. But I am old enough to know that I've seen a lot of conversions where people got all excited and cried and cried and cried and came to the altar because the sermon was so powerful and so manipulative and just tugged at the old heartstrings so well that I already say that people came forward and the family gets excited and everybody gets excited and then you watch those same people, nothing changes. They're right back out of the world, living like they always live. Believing like they always believe, but with the emotional moment is gone. That's what I suspect happened right here. When I was a teenage boy in high school, having the great privilege of preaching 
youth revivals. I had some buddies my age who were doing the same thing. In fact, one great friend of mine from the Nazarene Church, he and I even did a youth revival together. I preached one night, he preached another night. We graduated from high school. I stay here for a year or so, and then I head off to college in Oklahoma, and then I headed off to seminary, and I didn't know where they went. Many, many years later, I, I'm interested in finding out what are they doing, and I find out right after high school, that was, that was it with the preaching. That was it. Jesus, life got too tough, the trials were too hard, and the interests were so myriad that they saw things they loved more. Why is that? What happens? How is it that you can know people when you were a teenager? Every I remembered you guys so well when I was a teenager. I looked at them as saints back then. That's 45 years ago. They must have really loved Jesus. It must have been real faith. Right, guys? Look at where they are. And I think, I hope I don't have trouble for this, but I think you guys are 90 years old, aren't you? Think you're 90 years old. Uh, let's look at this last verse, okay? See if you can figure out what this means. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. He was omniscient. Right? You see, you and I, we don't know who is for real, really. We, we don't. We all claim to have some level of faith, and we do. And it, it may not be the same level for any of us. We hear this person's testimony that he or she is a Christian, and we take your word for it, and we should. You tell me you're a Christian, I accept that. Who am I to say, no, you're not? Of God. You know, we might look at their life and say, look, do I see any fruits? We might have some thoughts. We think they're a Christian, but we really don't know. You don't know a I Well, an omniscient God knows. He really knows what is in each person. And that's why we never go past judgment. Because God says, you and I look at the outward appearance. But guess where he looks? He looks in my heart. He sees your heart. He knows what's in your heart. I don't know what's in your heart. Even if you're struggling with your faith, even if you're struggling with believing, even if I see you falter or fail or dream, you know what? God sees your heart. <clears throat> and I believe with all my heart that when I get to heaven, and I trust I'll be there, I believe when I get to heaven, I'm going to see some folks and I'll say, Oh, wonderful! I didn't think they were going to be there. <laughs> and I also believe I'm going to be looking for some folks that aren't going to be there. So I ain't going to be passing judgment. Why is it we get so concerned about everybody else's business and what they're doing and not doing and start criticizing and condemning them for their faith instead of looking at their own. Because I have so much to do and so much work even at this age on myself. But all I'm going to do is just preach the word. And hope that people hear the word. How's your heart? What's in there? God knows. He knows perfectly. I 
tell you every week. What are the steps of salvation? Believe without faith is impossible. I mean, it has to start right there. Not some emotionalism. Pain. And the understanding that we're sinners. And it's sin that separates us from the Holy God. And that doesn't mean you will do away with all your sin. Nobody does. We're sinners. We have to confess that sin and repent of that sin. And then all of him will be believed. That's Jesus. Next week, we'll start with John chapter 3. I don't look ahead, but from my memory, I think that's. I think that's the story of Nicodemus. I think chapter 3 starts out with Nicodemus. Could be wrong. We'll find out next Sunday when we stand here. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. I love your word. We love it because we see the deep, deep truths that are there. We understand that faith, salvation comes. Help us, Lord, as we hear to respond to it. Bless all these people, I ask, in your holy name. Now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of his Holy Spirit be with you. God bless you, folks. Have a great week.